What's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of The Brave and Faithful. Uh, today, I have uh, an Army veteran. He is the founder of Team RWB, uh, also founded the nonprofit Positivity Project, which helps uh, partners with educators and schools to teach kids about positive psychology. Uh, Mike Irwin, what's going on, Mike? Hey, great to be here, Raiden. Looking forward to unpacking uh, as much as you want on, on a bunch of different topics. Well, appreciate uh, you again for taking the time. Uh, you know, before we talk about what you're doing now in, in your second service, can you just tell us a little bit about, you know, your time in the Army, uh, how long you served for, uh, and, you know, maybe a reason why, why you got in? Absolutely. So 1998, I started at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, and I... Was there for four years, graduated. So start of uh, 2002 is when I graduated. So, right, so 9-11 took place you know, at the start of my senior year. And so that made it a very uh, in intense senior year. Uh, I went intelligence in the army. And so I went on to do 13 years on active duty. Uh, did Iraq once and Afghanistan twice with the 1st Cavalry Division and 3rd Special Forces Group. And then after kind of like a seven-year window of like, preparing for or going downrange and coming back, I went to grad school and I was selected to attend the University of Michigan where I studied positive psychology and leadership. And then I went back uh, to West Point and I got a chance to teach those young cadets that, uh, that I was 10 years earlier and to help to shape them and think about their future service. And then I wrapped up my time on active duty down at Special Operations Command at McDill Air Force Base and did about a year there and transitioned to the reserves. And so I've been in the reserves now, it's hard to believe, but going on seven years this summer and I'm currently a Lieutenant Colonel in the reserves, but uh, you know, a lot of service in my family. My grandfather served in World War II. My other grandfather was a firefighter. Um, you know, my dad wa was a Sergeant on the Syracuse Police Department. My mom was actually the first woman to serve on the Syracuse Police Department back in 1974. Um, so again, a lot of service, uh, you know, a lot of educators in my family, uh, a lot of public servants. And so I think that really drew me to this idea of, as a young kid, right, 17 years old, you really don't know what's going on uh, in the world, especially back then, pre-information age, to this idea of how can I serve and be a part of something bigger than myself. It's awesome, man. So, you know, you mentioned, um, after deployments and, and things like that, you, you went back and got your, your, your degree and you, mm -hmm. you know, why did, why choose that uh, major in positive psychology? Yeah. So part of it is practical is that when I applied to go back and teach at West Point, they said, even though you majored in economics, when you were here, uh, your GMAT scores, your business, essentially your business school admissions test scores are good, but, but not anywhere good as a few other people who've applied. Uh, and they said, hey, we, we like your profile. We think that you should you know, apply to come back here. But if you do so, we're going to ask you to go to get a degree in psychology. And at first, I barely knew what psychology was. And I was a little hesitant, but I started digging in. And thankfully, I had a mentor named Major Dina Brager, and she was awesome. And she oriented me towards this discipline within psychology called positive psychology. And it was a young field. It was founded in 1998. So when I started learning about it, it was you know, really less than a decade old. And she said, there's this great guy at the University of Michigan named Dr. Chris Peterson. And I've met him. I think you'd really like him. I think that you would thrive uh, under his tutelage. And I think you should check it out. And so I did. And Chris was very receptive of the idea of having an active duty army captain come and study under him, even though it would be only for two years, because most PhD programs, you go there for five. And so okay. the army says, Hey, you can go there for two and then you're moving on. And so uh, a lot of it was just following the guidance of people who knew better than me and, and, and especially in Dina uh, Brager and Dr. Mike Matthews, a couple of people who really you know, oriented me that direction. But, you know, I absolutely very quickly fell in love with it. This idea of studying what goes right in life, studying the good in other people, looking at things like character strengths, like bravery and humility and fairness and forgiveness, creativity, enthusiasm. And so I looked at all these character strengths and I said, this is something that has a ton of application to leadership. So uh, my two years there were an absolute blast. And that's actually when I founded Team Red, White and Blue was in the middle of my time there. 
uh, I was that inspired and motivated by what I was learning in the field of positive psychology that I said, I'd love to be able to find a way to bring this into life and to apply it to life. And really that's what, you know, Team Red, White and Blue has been on a 11 year mission doing. Yeah, let's, uh, let's go delve into that. So you mentioned you, you founded Team RW while you were, while you were teaching. Um, how did that all kind of come about? Like, who, who, how did the idea about creating this, you know, this organization yeah. come about? So I was, uh, so I was a grad student and, uh, I think I was almost promoted to major when I was in grad school and I went to the VA hospital in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I met with a woman named Jennifer Lore and she was a social worker and she spent a lot of her time interacting with and talking to and supporting post nine 11 veterans, especially on the mental health front, but just on mental, social, physical health, all of it. And I met with her and I still can't to this day remember why she took a meeting with me. I'm glad she did. Uh, but I said, hey, you know, I am big into running. I've got an idea of creating an organization for that benefits and supports the military and veteran community. And we raise money and we raise awareness by doing marathons, half marathons, triathlons, CrossFit competitions, essentially tapping into the peer to peer fundraising approach. And, and I, so I said, if there was let's say blue sky, right? Uh, you know, blank, blank slate. What would you like to see an organization do? What, what is an unmet need right now from your view as someone who interacts with lots of these men and women you know, on a daily basis? And she said really without missing a beat that it was helping veterans to you know, just to get off their couch and to connect with each other, especially socially, um, but then also physically. And, and so that began the journey of Team Red, White, and Blue. And so uh, again, uh, not really exactly sure uh, how it all, you know, times, you know, uh, everything kind of blurs together, but, you know, made the decision. My wife was 39 and a half weeks pregnant with our first <laughs> child when, uh, you know, I, I got the green light from her to submit the IRS form 1023 to create Team Red, White, and Blue. I, I really, I say all the time, like, I still don't know what, like, made me do that, you know, knowing, like, what was on the horizon and, and everything else. But again, uh, so glad that I did. And in the process of kicking, kicking the organization off and shoving the ship off the shore, it didn't take very long to see that there was a lot of people who resonated with this idea and said, wow, yeah, I like to be a part of a team that supports you know, the veteran community. And, and people just kept on for the next couple of months and then the next year and the next handful of years, they kept raising their hands, signing up online. Hey, I want to join and become a part of Team Red, White, and Blue. So it was more of you know, supporting uh, other nonprofits in, in raising uh, fundraising. That was the, so. That was the initial idea. Exactly. Yeah. Like okay. The initial idea was, hey, like maybe we can we can uh, help support you know some veterans who are struggling, and we can identify them through other nonprofits or through the VA. But we were primarily essentially about raising funds, and it was over that time of that first year that it became clear that we were being called to do more than that. We were being called to create the fabric you know, of a team and to bring veterans together with each other and with people who support them to come together and not just come together to you know, hang out, but to come together and break a sweat. Right. Uh, because ironically, we started off by saying, hey, we're gonna do physical activity to raise money. Well, physical activity, physical activity essentially became what we did in, in many ways, what we do, um, right? And we use those physical activities, running, walking, hiking, rucking, swimming, uh, weightlifting, yoga, CrossFit, anything, anything that increases your heart rate, we use that as a vehicle to help veterans to connect with other people, right? Because like when you're breaking a sweat alongside someone, conversation comes a lot easier than just sitting there randomly across the table. Hey, how you doing? My name is Mike, right? When you're out there on a run together, it's just, it flows a lot easier. And, you know, we found that out pretty quickly in the days of Team Red, White, and Blue. Yeah, it's easier to kind of like break down the walls or say it's just to just totally. have an honest conversation with one another. And so I think that's what, you know, most veterans, obviously, you know, when they when they get out, it's the sense of community and camaraderie, camaraderie that, um, you know, they had in the service that they were uh, looking for. Totally. Once they got out. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, you started Team RWB. Uh, it's been, I, uh, I think it was 2010 from what, what yep. I read. Yep. Um, so, and, and then I also read that around 2013, you know, after a conference is when it actually started just blowing up mm -hmm. nationwide, right? 
uh, what specifically happened during that conference that kind of just had the organization. Yeah, so take off? it was, uh, it was really fitting. We, we chose to host a conference in Chicago in January. So it was freezing cold and <laughs> very windy, you know, coming to Chicago, but we, yeah, we came together and what we did is we brought our board, our advisory board. Um, and then we brought together uh, about 25 uh, maybe 20 to 25 volunteer leaders that had had raised their hand in 2011 or primarily 2012, you know, basically within the past six to nine months and said, hey, uh, I'd like to be a chapter captain. Uh, well, we didn't really know what that meant at the time. We, I mean, we just were one big national team trying to support veterans. Um, and that began the journey of trying to you know, to bring our mission down to the local level. And so we brought them all together and under the leadership of Blaine Smith and JJ Pinter, our full-time staff members, um, you know, our, first food, our first two full-time staff members, they really kind of built the playbook of, okay, this is how we're gonna start to build this out. This is how we're gonna scale it. This is what it's gonna look like to be a chapter leader. Uh, you're gonna get a budget to help you to in, engage veterans. We're gonna help you you know, with marketing materials to help you recruit new veterans. And so people came shot out of a cannon out of that meeting in Chicago for two to three days where we really built a lot of relationships and camaraderie with each other. Um, and those leaders went back to Fort Polk, Louisiana, San Diego, California. They went back to Florida and Texas and Maine and Syracuse, New York. And they went back there and, and they got after it. And they started to really grow our mission. And so that's when we went from at the time, maybe we had like 8,000 people on the books, you know, uh, and just started growing significantly, you know, um, after that. So, um, you know, after growing this organization, Team RWB, uh, you started, uh, you know, started another nonprofit, the Positivity Project, uh, I believe a couple of years, about 2015. Is that correct? That's correct. So, yeah, so it kind of gives you kind of build the bridge between Team RWB and the Positivity Project or P2 for short, is that uh, when I transitioned to the reserves in 2015, I moved on, um, you know, was still chairing the board at Team Red, White, and Blue, but we had a great thing going, you know, with our leaders there. And so uh, even though it was, you know, five years old and, and my, my, my true love and passion project, uh, it would not have been, you know, the right thing to do for me to try to insert myself into the staff um, because we had just really uh, a great thing going. Um, and so I really thought about, okay, like, hey, what else can I make a difference on? What else? Um, and, and like many times in life, the answer finds you. Uh, and this, uh, a teacher named Mark Heron, who I grew up with, we were altar servers together. We played basketball together at the Boys and Girls Club. Um, you know, he saw me posting on social media about Dr. Chris Peterson, who tragically died in October of 2012, suddenly of a heart attack. Um, and said, hey, this positive psychology stuff, can, can it be taught to kids? And so he talked to his principal, a guy by the name of Brett Woodcock, who I also happen to know, who I played baseball against and with growing up. Uh, and so we got on, a, on like a Zoom or it was probably like a Google Hangout or something. We got on some sort of video chat in 2015 and we talked about it. I was packing up and I was moving out of Tampa, Florida to return to North Carolina and, and begin my civilian world life and we started talking about this idea of, can you teach kids positive psychology? And so uh, I said, hey, I don't have kids in high school or in any school yet. My oldest was about to start kindergarten in the fall, but I was like, here's what I know. I know that character strengths and understanding how to build relationships with people is essential to life. And I think that this is something that can and, and ideally should be done with kids when they're, when they're starting out and they're young. So I said, I, I don't know, but I'm pretty confident that you can. And so with that, they took the idea really and started running. And then, you know, I reached out to who would become my co-founder in the organization, Jeff Bryan, a uh, fellow army veteran, West Point 2004, all American lacrosse player, two-time Iraq veteran. And we started connecting with, you know, the leaders from this school, Morgan Road Elementary in Syracuse, New York. And uh, they pulled us aside on our Veterans Day visit. Jeff and I made a visit, visit there in uh, like November 9th of 2015. And the teachers and principal and counselor all kind of pulled us aside and said, hey, this has had a huge impact in just three months. And I don't know what you guys are doing with your lives, but 
uh, you really need to stop doing whatever you're doing and figure out how to bring this, you know, to the world. And I remember Jeff and I both being like, wow, that's pretty powerful, you know, yeah. to hear that directly from teachers. And some have been teachers for five years, but a lot of them have been in for 10, 12, 15, 18 years. They had a lot of reps and a lot of experience under their belt. And, and to hear that from them was really emboldening. Uh, and that's what we did. So we said, hey, let's go. And so January 2016, Really, December 2015, we started running the Positivity Project as an organization, and, and, and we've been at it ever since. Yeah, about 775 schools right now, about 400,000 students uh, are reached through the P2. You know, Mike, um, you know, before, before that success happened, right, like what initially led you to, um, you know, to start this other nonprofit on top of uh, success you had on team RWB yeah. was it just trying to find some other way to serve some other way to provide um, service to a community or what was yeah. the whole reason yeah that? so it's interesting I, I had a conversation with my mentor uh, one of my mentors Jim Collins good to great built to last right one of the most successful leadership and organizational culture authors in the world uh, and philosophers on this stuff and you know in team red white and blue he referred to that as like muddy boot uh, entrepreneurship. Like, Hey, I'm out there. I'm struggling with like reintegration myself. In other words, my own boots are wet and muddy and I want to do something about it to solve my own problem. Right. That's, you know, muddy boot entrepreneurship. And then and, and what he pointed out to me was that, Hey, what's different, you know, in the positivity project is that you're trying to solve a problem that doesn't directly affect you. And I remember being just like blown away by that insight and that wisdom of like, Oh, geez. Yeah, and he said, just beware of that, that there's different challenges because when you're going through the struggle and you're trying to solve your own problems, it often will come a little bit easier because like you're living it and you're seeing it. When you're trying to analyze another problem or set or another challenge, that's different, right? Because you're not, it's not directly affecting you. Um, and so that was kind of his like, not cautionary tale, but just saying, hey, this is different. Um, but yeah, ultimately to answer your question, it was very much about how to serve. Jeff and I talk about this a lot that as we look at youth in America, as they grow up and become, you know, the citizens and leaders uh, of our country, I think it's great that, you know, kids learn how to you know, read and write and do math and science and all that. Um, all the academics are very important. Uh, but ultimately, you know, does your knowledge of algebra or the Pythagorean theorem, like help you be kind, right? Yeah. Does it help you to connect with and build a relationship for, uh, with somebody? Who really might need it and so it's simply saying we're trying to elevate the conversation about how important character education is in the k-12 through system because ultimately uh we need those young you know you know boys and girls growing into young men and women right to be people who have those positive characteristics those character strengths that i studied about back in grad school you know for the good of our country for the good of our democracy for the good of the future of the world and so um that's really been the intent and the goal behind the P2. Um, so it's speaking of, uh, you, know, you talked about your kids earlier. Uh, are they like uh, into the P2 now, like with their school or are they practicing oh, yeah. so, that as well? Yeah, so I mean, so my wife and I, we got five kids, uh, two, six, eight, 10 and 11. Uh, so we actually homeschool. Um, so um, we, you know, in large part, a big part of it is because we like, we think that character education Right, should be a, a large portion, you know, of the K through 12 track. Um, I've also uh, co-founded and I chair the board for a private independent Catholic high school called Father Vincent Capadano High, right outside Fort Bragg. So that's where my kids will be going. So as I look at their own pre-K to 12, so that 14 year pipeline, um, right, we're either directly molding it, you know, at our farm. So we live on 32 acres, which is another reason why we homeschool. Um, there's, there's lots of work to be done yeah. <laughs> and lots of learning to be done through growing things and raising animals and all that. Um, but, you know, we very much uh, believe in, in the power and the importance of it. So, yeah, so we, we do the P2, uh, you know, as a family. And, and then we do the Positivity Project at Father Capadano. You know, so we, our whole ninth grade seminar um, that goes two and a half hours per week is focusing on, you know, growing your understanding of your character and virtues. You know, uh, and so again, it's, it's a big, uh, I guess, reinforcement mm -hmm. of how important I think this stuff is for developing children, you know, into adults. And 
I think it's absolutely, again, going back to it, like academics, athletics, arts, all those things are, are important to developing well-rounded children and helping them to grow into responsible adults. Uh, but I worry that there's not enough emphasis placed on not just things like kindness and how to be a good person, but also things like, how do you be grateful? How are you brave when you're scared? How are you uh, enthusiastic when you've got something that you've got to get across the goal line? How, you know, creativity, like all of these very char- you know, various character strengths. Uh, I think that you know, we, we have an opportunity to really develop and groom these you know, in our young people so that they grow into more responsible, more character-driven adults. So, Mike, you, you mentioned you had five kids, man. Uh, kudos, kudos to you and your, your wife. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I have a three-year-old and an eight-month-old, but, um, you know, as any dad, right, there's concerns that you have and, and uh, it, you know, some, some thoughts that might run through your head, like, you know, mm-hmm. what's, what's going to happen to them when they grow up and things like that. Totally. What are, what are some of your concerns, um, you know, in this day and age with, with five kids as they grow up in this world? And what are some ways that we as parents can kind of, you know, alleviate some of those uh, stressors? Great question. I've got lots of answers on it. Uh, <laughs> at least lots of ideas. I don't know if they're the right answers, but they're my answers. Um, so I think that, you know, number one concern, I probably alluded to some of this before, is just this idea of building relationships. Mm. Um, you know, I think that when I, when I look to the data and the research of positive psychology, the number one predictor of life satisfaction is the quality of our relationships with our family and friends, teammates and coworkers, right? Basically who we do life with, how well we relate to those people is essential to being happy. In other words, you can have all the success, all the money, all the accomplishments, the biggest house, the nicest car, you name it, all that, all that material, you know, stuff in the world without good relationships it doesn't really count for a whole lot, right? Um, so that's that's one big point. So I, th- I do worry about the world has, you know, obviously through social media and, and many other things has become, I think, increasingly materialistic and, and much more about what you have, right? Where you go, those yeah. kinds of things. Um, and, and again, I think they get in the way very often of building relationships on that. And that ties into like, I guess this is kind of like, a, you, know, you know, if that was A, this is like, somewhere between A and B, but it, it's related. And that is all the changes coming down the pipeline with technology, with the metaverse, AI, machine learning, um, the, just the world you know, driven by algorithms. And I, I look at a world that continues to really, in many cases, engineer as many in-person interactions as possible out of life. Um, and you know, it's that pursuit of comfort and convenience. And, hey, it's more convenient for me to be able to go on my phone and order a Grubhub and have someone drop it off at my door, right? Mm-hmm. Or, and I'm not saying these are, ba- like, this will make you a bad person, right? It's just, it's, it's the more convenient thing to do. Hey, I'm going to go order my groceries online and have someone drop them off my house, right? Uh, I worry about the increased isolation and the reduced interactions that, like, my kids and, and frankly, even us as adults right now, uh, that has been accelerated in the past two years with COVID, right? Uh, find ourselves living in that, that world. And then you see, and you look at the metaverse and all this conversation about people making, you know, quote unquote land grabs in the metaverse, you know, we already know Fortnite and many other things were already like the metaverse has already kind of started, you know, probably five, seven, eight, ten years ago. But um, with all the additional focus and funding and the acceleration of it, you know, I, I think that you're going to look to have people who like may try to make the virtual working environment feel as good as possible. So, Hey, mm-hmm. why come to work and work beside people? Right. Uh, hey, why go to the ball game or to the concert? If you can put on your headset and you can basically feel like you're there, you know, if you've ever been on like the ride Soren at Disney world, or you know, like, like it's like the, you, you feel like you're there, like, you know, like, wow, it's, but it's not, right? Because like when you take that headset off, you're on your couch or in your bed and often on your own. Um, right. and, and so that, that concerns me deeply. You know, I'm not, I'm not a the sky is falling chicken little kind of person on it. I think technology is great. Look, we're having this conversation, you know, you know I think, are you in Florida? Where are you at? Uh, North Carolina. North, you're in North Carolina, what part? Yeah. Uh, Jacksonville. Yeah, okay, okay. So yeah, so I'm over, you know, outside Fort Bragg. So, right, like, but we're in the same state, but like you can be, all the way across the world and have a conversation with people and see their face and, and listen to them talk and all that. I mean, I remember just growing up, it wasn't 25, 30 years ago, 
Like I had to like to talk to my grandparents in Florida and I was in New York. I had to like, it was like 10 cents a minute, you know, and you had to <laughs> dial in all these numbers and they had to be home and you had to be home and, and you didn't see them. All you do is, you know, hear their voice um, and think of how far we've come in and all the benefits of it. So there's a, a tremendous amount of value and benefits in the growth of technology. Um, but I guess I go as far as to say, you know, too much of a good thing is still too much. Um, and I think that we're approaching the saturation point on, you know, too much of technology in our lives. Uh, and so what can we do on that? I mean, I, uh, you know, it's not a very popular opinion, but I don't know what age people, you know, allow their kids to, you know, to have right, smartphones right. and things like that. Like for us, we view that as probably like the ability to drive like age 16. Um, will they be uh, kind of the oddballs out maybe with some of their friends? Maybe. Um, but we're building up very much like a, an understanding of nonconformity and why it's important to be different, right? Um, and, and to have the courage to be different, you know, on things like that. So, um, yeah, but all these things, they're all worries, right? They're all worries you, yeah. know, that we, you know, that we have for our kids. And I think just more broadly, I would put them under that, you know, that umbrella of the ability to connect with and build meaningful relationships in their life, like to find like a spouse and have their own families. Um, and have their you know, friends who have their backs and that they stay close to each other, like as siblings. But then also over here is like how they continue to adapt to the metaverse and AI and just this rapidly changing world that we, that we live through, you know? So those are the two big concerns that I really hone in on. Yeah, I definitely want to highlight what you said about, you know, the acceleration with the past two years or so with COVID and the pandemic, it's just further accelerated that like you said the technology that we have now and and it's uh it's you know it's too much i think too much too soon uh for for mm -hmm. what, what's going on um and but you know how do you stop that how do you stop tech <laughs> how do you stop technology well i mean i think it's it's not about stopping it's just mitigating yeah the, you don't i mean that's the thing like the, the ship has sailed right you know, like like with everything and you know and people came and believe like when you talk to people who are much younger like wait a minute to like watch a show when you were, when you were my age, I'm um, talking to like a teenager, like you had to like either watch it, you had to be in front of TV at nine o'clock on Thursday night, or you had to have like your VCR set and hope that like it, <laughs> that it automatically recorded, you know, it's just, it's like a foreign concept to people that you had to, you know, go to Blockbuster and hope they had the movie that you wanted and then watch it and rewind it and bring it back within two days or you got to find like now it's like, of course, it's click, 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 right? Three, three taps of your thumb. And, and you're off and running. And so it's just, again, so many comforts and conveniences have, you know, have come forward, you know, at, at the hands of technology. And I think a lot of them are great. I just think that we should be cautious about um, too many of them uh, yeah. weaving their way deeply into our lives. Definitely. Definitely. Um, Mike, going back into, you know, your, uh, your nonprofits, um, you know, you built two great nonprofits uh, benefiting and serving, uh, you know, Two different uh, communities, so to say. Um, what what has been some of your, I guess, obstacles, hurdles that you had to overcome in, in building these organizations? Yeah, lots of them. I mean, <laughs> how, how much how much time do you got? Um, you know, I mean, I think you know one of the big things, that, you know, and we see this a lot. There's a lot of, you know, I kind of call it like you know entrepreneurship worship. You know, where a lot of people like really spend a lot of time, like, you know, the Elon Musks of the world and Zuckerbergs. And you, you look at all these people who created these, you know, wildly successful businesses or companies. Um, like, I kind of get it, right? Like, having been through it and, and know how stressful it is, you know, to get an organization off the ground. I, I like to say the first two years is a fight for legitimacy. You've got about two years to say, hey, this is legit, right? The, the need here is legit and what I'm doing is legit. Right. And if you can't do it within a couple of years, I think you're, you're unlikely to probably succeed, right? Cause you, if you're going hard and you're going all in for a couple of years, you've got to have some gains and some traction in, in most cases, you know? So I think that, you know, that's, you know, a big part of you know, the thought process, you know, for, for me about uh, starting an organization and seeing that, yeah, it is really, really hard to do that, to get it off the ground. You got to have enough of, of a strategy and vision and pull enough people on board. And there's a lot of things you need to do. Um, to get going. I think the biggest challenges are just um, as within anything is, is growing something. So once you get that fight for legitimacy, that's, you know, almost in my view for people like me, for leaders like me, that's, that's almost easier, 
right? Because I'm fighting and I'm pushing the idea really hard and I'm championing it. I'm tapping into my top character strengths of enthusiasm and optimism, you know, my one, two punch, and I'm bringing the energy behind what, you know, what we're doing. Um, but then starting to, to grow it. And this gets into the idea and the importance of mixed teams, right? Of having people who complement you well, right? And, and in every organization I've ever created, uh, it's, it's been huge. It's been huge to surround myself with people who complement and supplement my strengths and my weaknesses as well. Because if, I have, if I'm working with someone who's got a lot of the same strengths and the same weaknesses as me, then there's a lot of gaping holes, right. you know? And so uh, that is, I think, always important is to kind of get the people right. And the biggest challenges, I think, going back to that, boil down to people, you know, and, and people um, finding the right people, getting the right people on the bus, to quote Jim Collins. Um, sometimes people are at different points in their life. They don't want to get on the bus, even though like they would be a great addition to the team, right? Or people get on the bus and they realize, hey, like this is just not the right fit for me. Um, and then how you deal with just the inherent people challenges that come up, right? And, and especially in the past couple of years, um, and especially in a remote work environment, both uh, Team Red, White, and Blue, Positivity Product, you know, remote distributed workforces, you know, working through challenges is not easy. It's not like you come together and you sit around the same table every day and have conversations. And when there's an issue or a problem, you can talk it out like real time. You got to like get on someone's calendar and then you got to be free. And, and then you got to have a conversation via Zoom or via a phone call. And it's just, it's often not very productive, you know? So I think that getting the people right, but then also, um, you know, leaning into all the difficult people decisions and things that happen within an organization are, are, going to be the biggest problems and the biggest challenges that you face. So in, in talking about some of the challenges you've had um, on the flip side of that, you know, what, what would you say, you know, with the two organizations has been the most rewarding uh, experiences you've had since starting, you know, team RWV and the PT project? Oh yeah. Jeez. Um, lots of them. I mean, you know, when you, when you see kids on the P2 front, when you see them write about and talk about how much they've grown and how helpful it is that they go home and talk to their parents or siblings, you know, about some of the, the character strengths of the week. I mean, that's, that's feel good stuff right there. And the same thing with team red, white, and blue, when it comes to the veterans, when I get messages and people reach out and say, Hey, I'm, I am here literally because of team red, white, and blue. I was in such a bad place. And if I didn't find these people in my chapter or in this organization and I didn't get back into running, um, I'm, I'm highly confident the demons would have won. And, you know, when you hear that from people, man, it kind of just sucks the, you know, the oxygen right out you know, of the room because you're like, wow, um, like someone is here today because of this organization that we've created. So you know, those are the, some of the most powerful examples is when, when your work is life-saving, you yeah. know, and in the P2, it's not as life-saving, at least in the short term, but it's really teeing people up for, and, and my hope is that three, eight, 10 years down the road, people, you know, graduate and say, hey, I, this is the impact the positive product had on me when I was a high schooler, right? Or yeah. when I was in middle school, um, and, and I've been able to tap into that. And now here I am, I've got this job, I'm doing this in my life. And in large part due to the positivity project, like that's, those are the emails and messages that I look forward to, to receiving, you know, three, four or five years down the road. Yeah. And then maybe creating the future leaders of, of their community with, with the PT project. And uh, totally. That's awesome, man. Um, so uh, before we go to the second segment of the podcast here, Mike, um, you know, what's, what's one thing you want or, well, be, before I ask this, um, where can our audience find out more information about the P2 and how can they find out if their schools are involved? Yeah. And yeah. So pause, uh, pause project.org. Right. Um, and you can see, uh, you know, but bottom line, you, you, uh, should know it if your if your child is, is doing the positivity project, you know, we're really big in Virginia, North Carolina, New York, Michigan, uh, and then parts of Texas and central California. So, um, but yeah, you can go and you can see there on the website, you know, what schools, you know, where our schools are at. Awesome. And then obviously with uh, Team RWB, just go to the website, find the local chapter and they'll have. Same uh, thing. Yeah. Activities. Download our app. Yeah. And one of the other things you can do is you can download our app and join the team and yeah. discover events in your area um, within probably three minutes of downloading the app and registering. You can see, hey, there's a local run at this park at six o'clock on Wednesday night. 
right? Uh, and discover some of those events and those opportunities to connect. Definitely, definitely. Um, so Mike, what's one thing you want our listeners or viewers to take away from this episode? Oh, geez. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, the lead thing that I'd, I would highlight is that as the world is changing and as we continue to live through a very VUCA, a very volatile, unpredictable, chaotic, ambiguous environment that we find ourselves in, um, you know, I think it is important to know that, uh, while the pace of change and the pace of life continues to be fast and, and even as you know how are things shake out with covid and you know and when things get back to normal and all that um i think it's important to know that you know the humanity the human to human connection aspect of life is critical um and it's messy and it's hard and it's gotten harder in the past couple of years when you just think about divisiveness and like who in your family or your friends or you work with like or pro mask or anti mask or mm. vaccine or anti vaccine and like it, like all those kinds of things you know make it I, and have made it more difficult yeah. you know, to connect with a lot of other humans and I just think it's important to never forget you know that what the research has made very clear that the quality of our relationships with our family friends teammates and coworkers is critical and that because it is messy it is very easy to turn away and say you know what I'm not gonna lean in there I'm not gonna I just can't, I don't have the energy for it, you know? Uh, and sometimes that might be the right answer, but most of the times that's not the right answer. The answer is to lean in, right? To lean into our relationships. That's how I inscribe uh, leadership as a relationship, like lean into relationships. Um, and that when we lean in, while it may not be fun, certainly in the moment, kind of like a workout, right? Like, you know, like, oh man, this is workouts, great. <laughs> well, if you're working out and, it's, and you feel it's great, you're probably not working out very hard. You know, um, and it's really the, it's the benefit comes in the back end when you're, when it's over, when it's done, you know, and, and that's how I feel a lot about leaning into relationships. Yeah. Sometimes we got to do that. What's, what's hard, totally. <laughs> and, uh, what's uncomfortable and, and be comfortable with that. So, with that's that. right. So, um, uh, you know, you, you, you mentioned your books. Can you just talk to our audience a little bit about, you know, your first and your second book that just yeah. came out? Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, first book, lead yourself first inspiring leadership through solitude and second book is leadership is a relationship how to put people first in the digital world you know both books are at first at first glance it feels very different like whoa like one book's about solitude one's about relationships um but really what it, what it boils down to is that the books share a lot of common ground and that is how has the information age all the distractions all the noise social media you know, the over accessibility that, you know, that we all have, right. you know, the people have to us, how has that made leadership different? And therefore, how should we as leaders think a little bit differently about how we lead? And so the first book really makes the case that in the information age that we find ourselves in the ability to think, reflect and focus, right. Uh, are under attack uh, because all those things, thinking, reflecting and focusing, they require white space in our mind. They require us to be able to separate ourselves from our phones, our computers, the screens, the noise, like, and to go inward, right? In, into our mind, into our heart. And so that book really you know, says solitude is the antidote. Stepping back from the noise, turning off your phone, turning off your email, like and finding these periods of time to go inward is the answer. Building the bridge to the second book, it really is about in the information age, that relationship building is harder than ever. And so if you're a leader, we argue that one of the most important things that you do is not just to deliver results and get things done, but it's to look out for and to connect with and to build relationships with the people you lead, right? That leadership is not, you know, leadership and management are different things, right? And that management might be about getting a specific outcome and people and processes and leadership is a lot of it is about inspiration and it's about relationships and connecting with and inspiring people. And just like the first book talks about the information age has put certain things under attack, reflect, think, focus, that relationships are also under attack in the information age because we spend a lot more time virtual. Uh, even when we are in person, lots of times we're distracted. We're getting text messages. We're getting phone calls. We're getting, you know, notif push notifications, notifications. <laughs> yeah. on our phone. And, right. And like you feel it buzzing or you hear it dinging and yeah. it all, it's all noise and it's all distraction from the person right in front of you. 
And so we really make the case again, same thing of, of being like the first book says, you got to be intentional with your phone and with your distractions so that you can limit them so that you can think, focus, and reflect. Similar sort of message over here in leadership is relationship that you've got to find a way to be intentional with how you, you know, engage with your cell phone and smartphone and, and your internet and all that so that you can focus on building meaningful relationships and connecting with people when you're talking to them on Zoom, when you're on a phone call with them, and certainly when you're in person with them. Yeah, focusing on building those relationships. And also, I think it discipline ties into that as well as, as That's right. being intentional with your time, um, you know, and, and who you spend that time with. So very much. All right, Mike. So going into the second segment of our podcast here, this is what I call the fast five. These are the same five questions I ask all my guests. Are you ready? All right, let's roll. All right, Mike, uh, first question. What's one hobby you enjoy? Hobby, I am a hobby farmer. So uh, <laughs> we're getting some cattle this year, but we've had pigs and uh, meat turkeys, meat chickens, uh, egg layers, ducks. So uh, I'm not, it's not my job, but it's, it's definitely my hobby and where I spend a lot of my time. Nice, nice. Um, I mean, you got a big, big land out there to play around yes, with. <laughs> we do. Um, second question. If you had to choose one person to hang out with for one day, who would it be and why? Oh, geez. Alive or dead? Alive or dead. Oh boy. Um, my goodness. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure the answer for, uh, for me, some Catholic would be Jesus Christ. Um, but, uh, yeah, in terms of someone, I think like more realistic, like alive right now, someone who is, uh, alive, you know, Boy, uh, you know, that's a tough one. There's so many people across business and government and military, you know, that, you know, that have done so many things that I'm, you know, um, just, you know, in awe of. Uh, so, but like being someone from the military, I think I'd probably, um, you know, choose someone like, uh, you know, General McChrystal or, you know, Admiral McRaven, someone who's commanded, you know, the you know, joint, joint Special Operations Command at the highest level and really during the times where the operational tempo is the highest, I think they would be fascinating to ask, you know, a bunch of questions too. But yeah, if you open the aperture to people who have also been passed, you know, passed away, like it'd be a, a different list. A long list. <laughs> yes, a very long. I'm not sure. Man. I need some more time to think through how I'd parse that apart, but. Uh, next question, Mike, recommend a book for our audience to read. Oh, uh, I got lots of them, but I'd have to choose, um, you know, I'll have to give two. So well, if I have to choose one, it's The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho. Mm, that's a, uh, yeah, great book. Phenomenal book. Amazing. Right? Uh, Good to Great you know, by Jim Collins is amazing from an organizational leadership standpoint. Um, you know, I've, I've read some recent books that are, are great as well, but I think those, those two are, are the ones that come to the top of my mind. Yeah, I love that book, The Alchemist. Um, Unreal. All right, next question, Mike. What's what? What's your favorite quote, and why? Oh, geez, uh, John Wooden said, uh, and I used to have this hanging up in my in my um, closet as a kid. Failing to prepare is preparing to fail. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I remember that one being just really powerful, and I just I just loved it. Like, hey, you got to prepare, um, and that doesn't mean plan, 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 plan. It just means prepare. Like, get ready. You know, be be ready for the game. Be ready for the application. Be ready for the event, whatever it might be. You know, I love that. But again, I've got, geez, these are questions where I like, I got so many answers <laughs> to all these questions, you know, because um, I am, I'm a big quote guy. I post lots of quotes all the time. You know, uh, a lot of them, you know, are tap, tied into inspiration, but I'd go with that one from John Wooden. That's a great quote. Great quote. Um, and then finally, Mike, where do you see yourself in a year, five years, or even 10 years from now? You know, uh, I do know this idea, like you want, you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. Like I'm a huge believer in that. I, I think about the fact I'm living on a farm now, 32 acres. If you told me that five years ago, I would have been like, huh, what are, are you, <laughs> you, you're crazy. Right. Um, you know, it just never, never would have even crossed my mind. So um, yeah, sometimes like we just, obviously we change as we go through life and new opportunities and new doors open up and, and whether we're ready for them or not, like they open up. So, you know, I, I don't really know. I, I'd like to think that I, I, my wife and I kind of talk about this, but like, I, I think I want to die here, right? Hopefully mm -hmm. old, you know, but like on this property to be here and not move again, having moved all the time. I think I had like, I spent at least one year in nine different locations between the age of 22 and 33, you know, mm -hmm. between Iraq, Afghanistan, Fort Huachuca, Arizona, Fort Hood, Texas, Fort Bragg, Ann Arbor, West Point, SOCOM, 
you know, and just all these moves and really getting settled into a community and, and being here. Like I'm in a, in a part of like I'm outside the suburbs a little bit, so I'm not super rural, but rural enough where there's families that have been here for a hundred years and they own tons of land around here. And you're like, there's real power in that idea of, you know, Hey, that staying put, you know, and not right. feeling the need just because you can sell your house and move and go somewhere new because you, you can work remote you remotely or virtually the temptation is very real to continue being nomadic, but I'd like to think that, you know, that I'm not um, going to pursue that path. But I think that long-term I could, see, I would like to see myself as, you know, your director of CIA, director, you know, secretary of defense, um, you know, uh, you know, you know, you know, secretary of the VA, like some of those kinds of high level federal roles, I think that, you know, I could be a good fit for with more maturity and, and more experience under my belt once I get into my fifties. So, um, but right now I'm really focusing on team red, white, and blue, uh, you know, positivity products, you know, is, you know, we're really uh, much less involved there now than as I used to be, but as an advisor, you know, um, and as a strategic, you know, thinker there, you know, Father Capadano High School, uh, I want to bring that to more, you know, military communities. Uh, so I got a lot of, you know, ambitions to, to make a difference in the veteran community and the future of our country and in the Catholic community, um, specifically, you know, at military bases, you know, in the next 10, 15, 20 years. So there's no shortage of, uh, of work to be done and, and impact to be had. Bonus question here. Where do you see um, the leaders of of team RWB at, in five years? And where do you see the, the, the kids that are going through the PT project now in, in about five, 10 years? Yeah, I mean, our big focus at Team Red, Red and Blue really is around the, the mental, physical, and emotional health, right, of, of, our, of our leaders and, and of the veteran community. So really working to help veterans be better, um, um, just call it the fundamentals of health. So, re reducing nicotine and alcohol, uh, moderating caffeine, sleeping better, moving, uh, being more mindful and being more present, exercising, yeah, yeah, all those kinds of things, right? Like those are the, the fundamentals of wellness. And yeah. I'd like to see a lot more veterans in tune in practicing those fundamentals. As for the P2, I, I, yeah, I like to see students that are moving into high school and graduating and, and heading on for the rest of life, going into the military, going to college, going into the workforce, and taking what they've learned from the P2 with them so that they're better prepared for uh, the adversity of life. They're better prepared to connect and build relationships with people in their life because of what they've learned. Awesome, Mike, man. I appreciate, I'm sure I can speak for some the, the veteran community out there. Uh, thank you for all that you're doing with Team RWB and, and obviously the, um, the PT project and helping build future leaders in, in our community. Um, you know, Mike, one final question, where can our audience, where can they follow you? Where can they support you at? Yeah. So, I mean, so I'm on social media. I'm on Irwin RWB. Yeah. So with an E, so E R W I N RWB on Instagram and on Twitter. And yeah, I'm on LinkedIn as well, but you know, really just the uh, best way you can support, you know, is by joining uh, team red, white, and blue and becoming a part of the community, downloading our app and joining the team. And, you know, for those who are on, interested who have children like really looking into uh, the positivity project and encouraging the leaders at your children's school to check it out right um, those are two simple ways you know to uh, make a difference awesome mike and uh guys gals make sure you connect with mike on all the social media platforms uh join team rwb just go on the website find the local chapter and obviously be on the lookout for the positive project in the schools around the country uh, Mike, I appreciate yes, the time in and uh, hopefully I'll talk to you soon. Absolutely. Hey, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. It's been a great conversation and yeah, look forward to meeting in person here before too long. All right. Take care, Mike. All right.